next Pats podcast is presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. What's up, everybody? Welcome into the next Pats podcast. I'm Phil Perry, and it's time. It's time, friends. It's time to talk trade deadline. This is next Pats. The playoffs are very nearly a mathematical impossibility for the Patriots. So we're looking ahead. We're doing what we do. And we're wondering how the Patriots can improve before the Halloween NFL trade deadline this year. How should they handle it? What does Bill Belichick want to do in his heart of hearts at the deadline? Should Robert Kraft be involved in the team's approach there? And if Kraft asked an analytics department how to proceed, if he does want to be involved, what would those folks tell him? We've got Dr. Eric Eager from Sumer Sports to tell us about all of that and more, including some interesting conversation about whether or not the pocket passer is dead and if it's possible even to build a dependable offensive line dependably in 2023. Some really good stuff there. But let me tell you first what I'm hearing about the trade deadline as it relates to the Patriots. What I've been told is that Bill Belichick is going to want to do what Bill Belichick does, which is when every time his team is on the field. So even though, again, borderline mathematical impossibility that his team makes the postseason, we understand they're not going to be hoisting a Lombardi trophy this year. Bill Belichick has to understand the same thing. Even with that being the case, he is going to try to win. Now, would he be willing to make a trade? What I've been told is, of course. But when it comes to trading impact players versus players who are maybe in some ways already one foot out the door here at One Patriot Place, the dealing of the impact player is something that he's not going to be all that fond of, is what I've been told. Whether or not he actually does it, we'll see. Maybe he decides, I have to swallow hard here. I have to think about the future of the organization. As long as I'm in this position, whether or not I'm here moving forward, I'm going to do what I think is best for the team, which means this season, next season, the season after that. He's spoken about his job in those terms before. I have to put a team together this year next year, and for the foreseeable future. So we know he has the ability to think in those ways. Will he do it when it comes to this trade deadline, though? Again, what I've been told is, and let's just pick one position, for instance, to use it as an example. Let's pick the safety spot. If you were asking him whether or not he'd be inclined to deal somebody like Kyle Duggar, who would ostensibly have some value across the league, young player, has the ability to make plays on the football, which he showed last year, a little bit less so this year. Big hitter, can play him at the linebacker level, can play him deep if you need to, unbelievable athlete. Again, somebody who would have some value might return you something real in a trade. He'd be less inclined to deal someone like that, is my understanding, than someone, say, at the same position, like Jalen Mills or Adrian Phillips. Guys who have very small roles on this year's team, and probably aren't getting you a whole lot in a trade. And just sticking at that position, because I have been told a few things about guys at that position, my understanding is there's a lot of love for Kyle Duggar in the building here at One Patriot Place, where I am right now. As a young building block, he is somebody that people here would like to re-sign and move forward with as one of the young players around whom you would be building. Now, they haven't made that move yet. They haven't done enough to re-sign him to this point. But he's that kind of player in their eyes, is my understanding. Now, getting back to Belichick and his willingness or unwillingness to deal truly impact players. That, to me, if I'm Robert Kraft, would be a problem. Because if you don't deal players that you don't necessarily believe are part of your plan moving forward, you need to deal them now. Why is that? Let's talk a little comp pick formula, shall we? Okay, here's a list of Patriots free agents this upcoming offseason. Hunter Henry, Trent Brown, Kendrick Bourne, Riley Reef, Mike Gesicki, Ezekiel Elliott, Matthew Slater, Miles Bryant, Jalen Mills, Cody Davis, Kyle Duggar, Ty Montgomery, Trey Flowers, Mac Wilson, Josh Uche, Anthony Jennings, Will Greer, Pharaoh Brown, and Michael Wenu. That's according to overthecap.com. A lot of big names in there. 
And the reason I want to talk about the comp pick formula is because typically if you were to lose maybe not all of those players, but a good number of those players, they would qualify as what are known as compensatory free agents. Free agents who are on their next deal is going to make enough money, who are good enough players, would put up enough in the way of numbers to qualify as compensatory free agents. Now, what does that mean? The way the compensatory formula works, compensatory pick formula works, is that it includes free agents out as well as free agents in. So let's just use one of those players. The first player I mentioned there, Hunter Henry. If Hunter Henry walks in free agency and gets a pretty good deal on the open market, and you were to bring back a player who ends up getting a similar deal and gives the team something similar in terms of production relative to what Hunter Henry is giving to his new team. Remember, compensatory picks, you don't get them immediately, right? You have to wait a full season, then you get them the following off season. So say Hunter Henry signs with pick a team, the Vikings. And the Patriots bring someone in, relatively similar deals, relatively similar production. The Patriots would not get a comp pick for Hunter Henry in that scenario. It's a very rudimentary sort of example, but we've seen this happen before. Let's go back to the 2022 offseason. The Patriots lost Joe Tooney in free agency that year. Really good player. Got a really good deal for a guard on the open market when he went to Kansas City. He would have been worth a third round compensatory pick. However, the Patriots signed a similar free agent in terms of value in Matthew Judon. Now, was he quite as good? Did he make quite as much money as Tooney? No. But in terms of the compensatory pick formula, those two players essentially canceled each other out. So the Patriots got nothing, allowing Joe Tooney to walk in 2021. Adam Butler, just he was another compensatory free agent, qualified for that formula. Adam Butler was worth a sixth round pick, according to over the cap, in terms of compensatory value. But because the Patriots went crazy in free agency in that 2021 offseason, and they signed Jalen Mills, another sixth round value when it comes to the compensatory pick formula, those two players canceled each other out. The Patriots did not get a pick for Adam Butler. Now, why are we going through all this? Well, because the Patriots have over $100 million in available cap space to them next offseason as we sit here right now. If they go on the kind of spending spree that they went on in 2021, and they acquire a lot of these compensatory free agents, well, they could, in all likelihood, cancel out whatever compensatory picks you would have gotten for the free agents who are scheduled to go out the door this offseason via free agency. So if the Patriots end up spending big in 2024, there's a very high likelihood if they lose Kendrick Bourne, Hunter Henry, Kyle Duggar, Josh Uje, Mike and Wenu to free agency, that they will have brought in free agents who would cancel out those comp picks. And those players that I just mentioned walk out the door and you get nothing in return. Not ideal, right? Especially for a team that's rebuilding, that should be trying to stockpile picks, stockpile assets so they can build for the future. So you have to make those moves now before the deadline, hard as they may be, in order to maximize their value. Now that's in my opinion. And I'm focused specifically on the players that you don't think will be around next year. You have conversations with them, conversations with their agents. You get a feel for what their future plans might be, whether or not they're enjoying it here right now. And maybe you get a good idea of who it is or should be in your long-term plans and who shouldn't. Maybe Kyle Duggar would love to be here. Maybe he's just waiting to see what else might be out there, but all things being equal, he's let you know that he would love to be back. And maybe you feel the same way. But if you're looking at a different player who'd love to have more opportunity to maybe produce more, maybe in a different style offense, maybe you're talking about Kendrick Bourne and he's wondering, Man, what would I be able to do in Kansas City right now? Where their receiver room is not very good. And he might go in there today and be their first or second best option at the receiver position. Does he want to be back? And if he doesn't, shouldn't you be trying to deal him right now? Yes, of course, in my opinion, the Patriots should be sellers. And you know who agrees with me? 
Dr. Eric Eager. Probably one of the smartest people we've ever had on this podcast. So let's get to our discussion with Eric right now. All right, there he is, Eric Eager, VP and partner at Sumer Sports. He's the co-host of the Sumer Sports Show with Thomas Dimitrov, former director of college scouting, obviously general manager of the Falcons. Eric, thanks so much for being with us here on Expats, man. Hey, thanks for having me on. And uh, yeah, it's been a it's been an interesting uh, first few weeks of the season here. No question about it. It's been interesting. I, I should ask you first, how has it been for you as a longtime, obviously NFL follower, follower of Bill Belichick and all the success he's had here in New England? to just see what the Patriots have become here in 2023. Yeah, it, it's interesting because, you know, it. I don't know who said it. I um, can't remember who exactly Thomas told me said it to him, but it, it just doesn't always end well, you know, and, and not to say that it's ending in New England or anything, but, you know, Belichick has been a revelation for so long in so many places, New York, Cleveland, obviously now New England, um, where – you know, I I feel like in my brain I accepted that there would be tough times, and then in but in my heart I I it still pains me to see the way that it's gone so far. So, um, you know, I was somebody who you know was watching that game on Sunday. I very much believed that they would beat uh, the Raiders, and you know, it, it just there are there are times when you wonder if you're watching you know sort of the same coach that that you you have for the last twenty years or so. Yeah, and that's what's been odd about it is you know, just things like attention to detail, it feel like are, are lacking now in a way that they weren't before. Uh, but I think the biggest problem for those of us that, that are following the team as closely as we are, that we always come back to is the roster and the talent on the roster. And that's why I wanted to have you on the show here today, because, you know, at Sumer Sports, and I'm, I'm pulling from the Twitter description here but i think this is a good sort of summation of what it is i think you guys do and it says you're providing best in class quantitative analysis aimed at creating precision in player acquisition and roster management in the nfl and so where have the patriots gone wrong eric is there is there an overarching theme here to the patriots roster build that you've looked at and said you know it's not necessarily a position or two although i'm sure we could highlight a few but is there a, is there a uh, an umbrella issue here that they've been dealing with that sort of led to this downfall? Well, it, it's it's a lot of the weaknesses that they've kind of had at times during the last you know decade or so. Um, you know, the drafts I think as as you guys have probably chronicled have not gone as well player for player as they did previously. Um, and yet, you know, I uh, my former boss Chris Collinsworth at PFF always used to say like Tom Brady protected his offensive line a lot more than the other way around. And, you know, you look at the offensive line, for example, and, you know, through injuries, but also, um, you know, ineffective play, um, you know, that it, it's, it shows up, right. And it shows up in these weak link systems where, you know, the offensive line isn't, you know, I, I think Trent Brown, for example, is like playing pretty good football, but when, you know, the other four guys are struggling or three out of the other four guys are struggling, um, it doesn't actually matter how good the left tackle is playing, you know, in a way. And, you know, Tom Brady always used to be this guy that could paper over those those difficulties, and he's not there. And Mac Jones is a guy who I think if that offensive line is playing well, it doesn't really come up, and 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 they are effective. So there, there's that part of it that's the wide receiver position. And I know, you know, you think back to the years where the Patriots were – for them down, you know, 2006, you know, you, you, you had Jabbar Gaffney and Rache Caldwell and Chad John or Chad Jackson. And, you know, back 2013, where, you know, they still made the conference title game, but it was a little weaker. You're talking about, you know, Dobson and, uh, you know, Edelman's like growing into that number one role and like, they're kind of back to that. And it's not necessarily for lack of trying. I think Kendrick Bourne, you know, was a good acquisition. I think Juju, you know, Devontae Parker are all like defensible acquisitions at the time, but you kind of add it all up. And then you throw in the fact that the drafts have been really ineffective for them at that position. And the offense, you know, is just weak in positions where you need depth and you need at least like a superstar or two. And when you, when you, when you, for years and years and years, we're able to overcome that because the quarterback is so good. When you bring in a guy that's maybe kind of an average player at the position that can't elevate people around him, it just magnifies those issues. And then, 
you know, that that doesn't allow Belichick to, you know, take a defense that is full of players who are similarly kind of role players in the NFL, guys like Jelani Tavai, guys like, um, you know, uh, even like Josh Uchi, who I think is like a good player here, but may not be a great player anywhere else. Uh, Jabril Peppers, guys like that. Like he's doing wonderful work on that side of the ball, but it doesn't really end up mattering when the team can't score points. And so it, it's just that not having that one guy that can overcome a multitude of sins on offense it is really kind of cascading through the whole uh, roster deficiencies in ways that it never had before. And I think offensively, you know, obviously we think about the quarterback as being the position that if you have the right guy can sort of paper over some of those deficiencies. But it sounds like, you know, even at a position like receiver, we have seen, Eric, the the bright, shiny object who makes a lot of money and requires a lot in terms of trade capital out the door in order to acquire that guy really change the face of a team and change outcomes on a regular basis. Is that a team building strategy that the Patriots are going to, to have to shift here at Gillette because they, they've been so reluctant to go after that shiny object and pay big money or make a, a huge swing in terms of a trade to acquire that guy that can, can change things for them offensively. Is that, do you have to, do you have to just go all out to get that kind of player in today's game? I, I think when you have a quarterback on a rookie deal, you, you almost always have to, right. And, and um, you look at, you know, that's, you know, when you look at where Tyreek Hill moved over from Kansas City to to Miami, it was 100% that, right? Tyreek Hill was there to build Patrick Mahomes' confidence and, and build Patrick Mahomes' uh, legacy. And then he was also there to help Patrick Mahomes fortify that legacy. Because once the guy makes 40 to 50 million a year, it's not tenable to have a wide receiver making 30 million a year. And so, um, you know, so he goes to another franchise with a quarterback making rookie money, and now he's elevating his confidence and building him up from a statistical and a, just an overall football perspective. You know, when when the Patriots in 2021, now they didn't know that they were going to get Mac Jones when they did this, but when they went out and got John U. Smith, Hunter Henry, Nelson Aguilar, uh, Kendrick Bourne, like they were trying to build that offense, but they were trying to build it in in weird ways. It was almost sort of this throwback back to the 2010s, you know, when Gronk and Hernandez and Algie Crumpler and guys like that that were trying to come in and and be a tight end centric offense. And I still think that can work. They just swung and missed a little bit, and that's where you know a, a trade for a guy who's already established might might end up working. I don't know if it ends up digging them out of this hole just because Mac is already, you know, by the season's end, he'll be 75% of the way through his rookie deal. And so you almost have to like restart the clock and try that over again. But it probably in hindsight would have been beneficial because I think, you know, if you put this, this wide receiving core for the Patriots on the chiefs, I actually think it's better than what the chiefs have. You know, Smith Schuster was obviously a good chief last year. Parker is a good, you know, they're all kind of five out of tens and, that, you know, the Chiefs are a bunch of three and four out of tens, but because the quarterback's also a five out of 10, it's, it's kind of, it, it's defeatist, right? And where, so I, I think like that understanding kind of that, that conundrum there where, you know, you, you kind of want to pair highly priced support with cheap quarterback play. And then the other way around when that guy finally reveals himself as being a legitimate option at the position. So as we sit here, Eric, we're about, two weeks, I don't know, week and a half or so away from the NFL trade deadline. And based on people that I've spoken to here, you know, everyone assumes that Bill Belichick will remain Bill Belichick, meaning he's going to try to win every single game this season, no matter what. And if they are three and 12, he's going to try to go four and 12 at the end of the year, even if it really means at the end of the day, very, very little. But if you were advising Robert Kraft, and say he came to you in your office and you you were here at one Patriot place. And he said, Eric, what should we do at the trade deadline? What would you tell him? I, you know, right now at sumersports.com, we have a, our simulation up. We have New England with a projected 4.9 wins. We actually have them with a 1.7% chance of making the playoffs and a 9.8% chance of earning the number one pick. Um, I think it's going to be tough because I think Arizona is dead set on doing that. But to me, I think, you know, you got into this mess because you lacked high-end quarterback play. 
I think that you're only going to get out of this mess if you acquire high-end quarterback play. So I, I think you have to look at a team like Kansas City and you have to say, look, like, do you want Juju Smith-Schuster back? Do you want a guy like Kendrick Bourne? Um, and I know that their you know, contracts are not necessarily easy to t- trade. There, there's a lot of pass rush talent in the NFL right now, but there's also contending teams that could use a Josh Uchi, uh, for example. There are teams that you know it, you know could use a guy like uh, Jabril Peppers, and, and and so I would be a seller, but I I know that there's a lot of pride, and I know that that it, that's a tough admit admission. But when you look at like the path to the playoffs in the AFC. Um, your own division has two teams that are probably going to contend for the Super Bowl and the Dolphins and the Bills and a team in the Jets that, you know, you've had their number obviously this year with one win, but um, but that team is probably better than you are right now. So I, I think, again, the, this this mess was gotten into slowly, but but gotten into because of lack of high end quarterback play. I think that the only way to get out and to get out fast uh, is to acquire high-end quarterback play. And that's not really going to happen this time of year. It's going to happen next April. And so I think you got to build the war chest for next April. Just really quickly, Eric, last thing I wanted to ask you, because I do think they could obviously be in the mix for a new quarterback this offseason. They have had a type at quarterback. It has been the pocket passer. It has been the quick processor. It has been the good decision maker. It's at least, you know, in theory, what they've wanted. In today's NFL, with all the inferior, all the information at your disposal, do you need to have a more mobile player at that position? Is the pocket passer the idea of the pocket passer? Is that a dinosaur in today's NFL? It it is, and and I think one of the reasons why is you know since 2011, you know the the offensive line play has just decreased because of, you don't have nearly as much practice time, you don't have nearly as much development time. Um, it's just incredibly hard to build an offensive line. Uh, in an efficient way that's going to keep your quarterback upright. And so, you know, we've seen it with, for example, Joe Burrow, like just like the the small differences between his arm talent and somebody like Mahomes or Josh Allen, like when he gets injured, it's it, it turns really poorly for him. I think not only do you need a guy that has some athleticism, but you also need some size. And I think we've moved away, you know, the Kyler Murray's being drafted, uh, even the Bryce Young's at first overall this year. I think that the NFL is probably not only, and this is a tough ask, right? This is why these athletes are so rare, but you're going to have to move not only to um, athletic players at the position, but also bigger players at the position because, you know, the, the injuries are just like what kills you at the position. And I know Mac, you know, has taken a lot of hits. He's a tough, I mean, he's a tough player. There, there's no doubt about that. Um, but then when, when those hits start piling up, the physical deficiencies in some of these guys also pop up. Eric Eager, thank you so much for joining us here on Next Pats. This has been great. Make sure you check out all of their work at sumersports.com. So much good information there for people that are interested in sort of the modern day statistical look at NFL play. You got breakdowns by position group, EPA per play, everything you could ever want there at sumersports.com. And uh, please go listen to the Sumer Sports Show with Thomas Dimitrov. Eric, thanks again, man. This is awesome. Hey, thanks for having me on. Take care. Snap into action this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get into the action. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash NBCSB and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. MA21 Plus and President MA. Hope is here. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as a non-withdrawable bonus bet that expires seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling helpline ma.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support. Play it smart from the start. GameSenseMA.com or call 1-800-GAM-1234. Great stuff there from Eric. And it's very clear where his opinion is in terms of how the Patriots should proceed moving forward, how they should handle this trade deadline. We are very much aligned, I think, in that respect. Now, to me, the next question is, who are you selling? And what could you get in return, potentially? I did a little bit of research here, and I do want to bring up a couple of the big names that are scheduled to hit free agency for the Patriots. And let's take a stab at what they might be able to bring back to New England if they are sent out the door before Halloween. 
Let's start with the pass rusher, Josh Uche, because everybody's looking for pass rushers, right? Contending teams across the board can always, always, always use more help there. And he's been really productive the last couple of years, even this year, where the sack numbers aren't quite what they were, say, the second half of last year for him in 2022. The pass rush win rate is still really good, 16.5%. Last year, it was closer to 20. He's still really, really effective in that role. And it's been a niche role here in New England. He's essentially a third down pass rushing specialist. Now, whether or not you're a team that's looking for that, or maybe you're a team that has this different style scheme, and, and maybe Uche could be a three down player for you, I think he would have some interest on the trade market. Now let's look at last year's trade deadline. Talk about a couple of pass rushers who were dealt. Bradley Chubb went from Denver to Miami, got a huge haul for the Broncos. 2023 first round pick, uh, Chase Edmonds, the running back. He was in the last year of his rookie deal, as Uche is, but he was a first round pick. So he was in his fifth year. And then he immediately with the Dolphins signed a five-year, $110 million extension he had made a Pro Bowl. He made a Pro Bowl after being dealt. This is a different level player, in my opinion, than Uche. So that kind of haul, not something that the Patriots should be anticipating. How about Robert Quinn, though? More of a veteran pass rusher. Also dealt last year. Now, he had two years left on his contract at the time, and he was dealt from Chicago to the Eagles. But... He lopped off the last two years of his contract. They were non-guaranteed anyway. Lopped them off. Chicago actually paid $7.1 million of his remaining salary just to get him off the books. And he ends up going to Philly for a fourth-round pick. That, to me, is closer to the bone in terms of what the Patriots should expect if they try to trade Josh Uche. And in my opinion, maybe even a little bit more. Now, Robert Quinn was a veteran guy, had done a lot more in the league than Uche has right now. But if you're paying for past performance, what are you doing? And I don't think that's what Howie Roseman really was planning on. I think he looked at a guy who in 2021 in Robert Quinn had 18 and a half sacks, 18 and a half. He had just one though, before he was traded in 2022 for the Bears. And his pass rush win rate, according to Pro Football Focus, was not amazing. Even in 2021, when he had all those sacks, his pass rush win rate, excuse me, was lower at 13% than Uche's this year or last year. And when he was traded in 2022, again, he had just the one sack before he was dealt. His pass rush win rate was just over 10%. Again, far below Uche's 19.2 last year and his 16.5% win rate this year. So does a fourth round pick seem right for Uche? When that's what the Eagles were willing to give up for Quinn? I think, especially if you're talking about an analytically driven team, and there are a few front offices that are a little bit more forward thinking when it comes to that sort of stuff than others, you might be able to get a third for Josh Uche. And if you can, and you're worried about being able to re-sign him for 2024 and beyond, I think you have to pull the trigger there. The Atlanta Falcons, the Seattle Seahawks, the LA Rams, all NFC teams that I think will be looking for pass rush help that are trying to make the postseason Maybe they all could be interested in Uche. How about the Jacksonville Jaguars? They could use some pass rush help as well. They're trying to win that AFC South. I think you could have some takers on Uche, and I think he might end up landing you the biggest return in a deal. Let's talk about receiver now, too. And Kendrick Bourne, to me, would be the one, the one that you could deal because he'd be the one who would get you anything in return. Is anybody trading away Juju Smith-Schuster? I know Eric Eager brought it up. Would you send him back to Kansas City? I think the way... He's looked physically, number one, never mind how he's produced, just how he's looked and what his health might be might prevent the Patriots from getting anything meaningful in return for Juju Smith-Schuster. And when it comes to Parker, really, again, what are you getting in return if you were to trade that player? I guess maybe there's the possibility that an offense that's better than the Patriots is looking at their team and they say, well, if we just had a boundary receiver, who had some size, could occasionally win a 50-50 ball, that would have some real value for us offensively. Maybe you'd get something back for Parker. But let's talk about Kendrick Bourne. He's 28 years old. So 
unfortunately for any NFL player, that's closer to the end than the beginning. Well, let's look at last year. Look at some of the receivers who were dealt. Chase Claypool was one, but he was 24 at the time. He was a second round pick perceived to have all kinds of physical ability. He got dealt for a second round pick. Now that looks like a horrible, horrible deal in retrospect. <laughs> He's now since made his way to Miami for very, very little, but that was the going rate for Chase Claypool at the time. I don't think it's a great comp for Bourne based on his pedigree as a second round pick. How about Kadarius Tony also dealt last year at the deadline. He was a first round pick in 2021. Now he was deemed worthy of essentially a 2023 third round comp pick, a late third round pick. Again, though, I'm not sure the comp is right for Bourne because even though he had plenty of issues, he continues to have uh, issues just staying on the field, consistency, hands, has not really lived up to that first-round billing at all. But he was younger, and first-round picks get so many opportunities in teams, front offices, across the league, fall in love with these guys when they have that first-round billing in front of their names. I, again, I'm not sure it's the best comp for Bourne. This one might be a little bit better, and it might be a little depressing for Patriots fans, but let's get into it. Okay, it's Robbie Anderson. Robbie Chosen now, but he was 29 years old. And before he was traded to the Cardinals at the deadline last year, he had just 13 catches with the Panthers, 206 yards. Bourne's better than that, right? First of all, he's younger. Second of all, he's got 28 catches for 307 yards. Right now, he's coming off a 10-catch game in Vegas where he looked really impressive. I thought after the catch, he's better than Anderson now. He's better than Anderson was when Anderson was dealt last year. So the return for Anderson at the time was a 2024 sixth, the future sixth, and a way in the future seventh, a 2025 seventh. I think if you even package those together, you're talking about the equivalent of a seventh round pick, a current seventh round pick. You should be able to get more than that for Bourne, in my opinion. But do you get much more? Should it be a fourth? I think it, in some ways, depends on how desperate teams are. For instance, again, if you're talking to the Chiefs and they're so hungry for a capable receiver, would they bite on that Kadarius Tony type of return and give up a comp pick? Or maybe it's even their own original third-round pick. I'm not sure they'd go there, but maybe a fourth. Again, you might need a bidding war of sorts, um, and if you don't have that, then, you know, I'm worried a team would look at, if I'm the Patriots, I'm worried a team would look at that Anderson trade and say, you know, it's essentially what we're getting in terms of the age and where the guy fits into an offense. He's not a number one, the same way Anderson wasn't a number one when he was dealt. So, you know, you're really talking more a day three pick new England. Sorry. And that one, I think would be hard for Patriots fans to swallow. And that, if that's the return. If it's a day three pick and it's not a late third and it's and it's maybe even a latish day three pick, would you say as much as you'd love to build that coffer of draft picks as Dr. Eric Eager suggested that Patriots should be doing, would you look at that and say, we'd actually be willing to take our chances with him in free agency that we could bring him back? Because what he's done when he's been given an opportunity to play 2021 and now 2023 he's shown he can give us something and there is something to his personality fitting in here in new england i think they need as many sort of effervescent joy for football types of personalities in that locker room as they can get and so if somebody's offering only a fifth or sixth round pick for kendrick Bourne, I'm, i might say no to that even knowing that he might leave via free agency next year because i might rather try to figure out a way to hold on to him. Okay, let's get to one more position. Let's talk tight end. And first, let me say this. Hunter Henry's a captain this year, just voted as a captain. I think he has quickly become one of the most well-respected players in the Patriots locker room. Does he want to be here for the long haul? I think he relishes the opportunity to be a captain. I do think he likes it here. I don't think he loves the losing. How could you blame him? Who does? <laughs> and so... Is he a lock to want to stay if he makes it to free agency? I wouldn't say that. But if he wants to be here, I really think the Patriots should want him here. And he's somebody that they should be trying to extend, trying to make him one of those core 
leaders we just talked about on the Patriots Talk Pod earlier this week about how they're really lacking in that area. They don't have many guys that are veteran guys under contract that you would look to as a leader. I think Hunter Henry should be one, and I think they should they should make a real effort to bring him back. If they don't think they can, let's talk about Hunter Henry and Mike Kosicki. They're both free agents. Now, the big trade involving a tight end last year that we'll look at as a comp was TJ Hawkinson. Okay, he went out the door for a 2023 fourth, a conditional fifth, and he brought back a 2023 second and a 2023 fourth. And then immediately when he left Detroit for Minnesota, he signed a four-year, $68.5 million extension. Okay, neither Henry nor Gesicki fall into that category for TJ Hawkinson. So that kind of return, not making its way back to New England. A second, basically... A second and a new contract um, because there's a couple fourth round picks there that essentially cancel each other out, in my opinion. So Hunter Henry's not bringing you back a second. Neither is Mike Kosicki. But but if you want to go back two years of the trade deadline, Zach Ertz was dealt in 2021, and he brought back a fifth and a player, which I would sort of consider the equivalent of a fourth round pick. Could you get that for Hunter Henry? I think you might be able to. How about in Cincinnati where they're really getting no production from any of their tight ends? Where, you know, they're they're making a push. They're trying to win a Super Bowl here, even this year, as badly as it started for them. T. Higgins is in the last year of his deal. Who knows if he's able to come back? It's going to get very dicey in terms of how they're able to keep that roster together in the foreseeable future. Would you not give up a fourth round pick for a real tight end? Somebody to give you another option in the pass game? Somebody who, as a third or fourth option, I think could be, Really, really good. Here in New England, he's a borderline one. But in Cincinnati, good quarterback, good offense. That's a move that I would make if I'm them, that I'd be calling the Patriots about if I'm them, if the Patriots aren't able to lock him down for the foreseeable future. And I am willing to give up a fourth-round pick for Hunter Henry. And Mike Gesicki wouldn't be the same kind of comp, but maybe you're talking about a fifth-round pick if it's Gesicki. So the Hawkinson example Not a great one, but I think you could look at it and say, okay, Henry's a little bit older. He's not quite as productive. He's not getting you a second round pick the way Hawkinson got you a second round pick. But could he get you a fourth? You know, the same way Zach Ertz did. I really, I think he could. And so maybe that's an option for the Patriots again, but only if they're not able to keep him around because I think that's somebody you might want to work to keep around. Kyle Duggar, again, somebody that the team would like to build with moving forward. Michael Wynn, who's hurt right now. And he's a guard. He's a sixth round pick. When he's been on the field, he has been really good, but not so much this year. I'm just not sure you'd be getting a King's Ransom for a Wenu as well. A little bit harder to peg his value based on that injury. So there's a few examples of what the Patriots might be able to do. Again, will they actually be able to deal these guys? That's one thing. Is Bill Belichick willing to deal these guys? That's another question. Will Kraft force his hand? Or does Kraft actually do just the opposite as if to say, hey, I don't want you trading any of these guys because I want whoever is making those decisions for me this off season, if it's not going to be you, I want them deciding on the Kendrick Bournes and the Kyle Duggars and the Josh Uche's and the Hunter Henry's. It's a fascinating time. It's an unprecedented sort of time for us, myself. I'll speak for myself covering this team since 2011, but you know, you know, next Pat's, is going to be all over these kinds of topics moving forward because that's what matters most now. Even we're just in week seven. But what's next for this team, as in in 2024, is obviously what matters most for this team right now. All right, that's it for this edition of Next Pats. Thanks so much for listening, guys. Thanks to the Skull Crusher, John Henry, for producing this thing and doing a bang-up job, as he always does. Keep an eye out for our next Next Pats episode next week. Who knows? Maybe we'll even have a trade to discuss. See you then.